Now, I haven't timed this, but I figure I'm going last, so the error margins are five minutes, either way, of seven. But I want to claim 30 seconds uh, extra to say something about Natalie, who mentioned at the beginning that she received some rather excellent news last night, which I believe is now in the public domain, that Pandora's Jar, her most recent book, hit the New York Times top 10 list this week. <laughs> Number six, right? Anyway, so let's finish off um, with some science. I know I'm the token scientist here, and I'm semi-including Marcus in that, but maths isn't really science, is it? <laughs> Um, we sometimes think about science as being a sort of apolitical and amoral um, uh, endeavour, but I don't. I, I fundamentally think of science as not a neutral endeavour at all, but something that is inherently good and inherently hopeful. Um, I'm going to pepper this talk, as I do with all of my work, with quotations from other people. I always figure that someone has said the thing that I'm thinking uh, before me and probably better. Um, it, it is true that the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake is fundamentally a noble ambition, um, but my first quote comes from the former editor of New Scientist, Alan, Ar Alan Anderson, who said that science is interesting, and if you don't agree with me, you can fuck off. <laughs> now, I think he was only partially correct in, in saying that, because science, I, I believe, is also in service of humankind. Knowledge unshared has no value whatsoever. And what we do as scientists and science communicators in our research and in our talks and on Radio 4 and at Hay and here is that we share ideas so that they can be tested and refined, not simply so that we can lean in towards the truth, but that we can address problems that we can alleviate suffering, and we can fix the world, and we can fix people. We are, of course, living in an unprecedented era where the biggest challenges that we face are indeed ones that have a scientific core to them. The climate crisis, the desecration of biodiversity, and of course, this damned pandemic, which, despite the proclamations of our leaders, continues in infections, in Omicron, in long COVID, and the repercussions of the actions of our leaders will echo for many years, decades into the future. I am reminded of that very famous line from The Great Gatsby. They were careless people. They smashed up things and creatures and then retreated back into their own money or their vast carelessness or whatever it was that kept them together and let other people clean up the mess that they had made. Now, I paraphrase that quotation in my last book, um, which was about the history of eugenics coming to Radio 4 soon. Um, and it, not just because one of the themes of Gatsby is white supremacy and eugenics, very explicitly in the first few, few pages, something I had missed in the, my first 17 readings of that book, um, nor that the characters that F. Scott Fitzgerald was drawing from um, were the funders of the US eugenics movement and who also were instrumental in funding and influencing the rise of eugenics policy in Weimar and Nazi Germany. I quote it more broadly because it was and is the same carelessness that took a brilliant idea, I believe, the best idea that anyone's ever had, evolution by natural selection, and they distorted it and they misrepresented it and they marshaled it into a political ideology, a racist, classist, ableist, sexist ideology that served only the powerful at the expense of the powerless. So that's where my work is at the moment. That's my current book. The one before that was about the history of scientific racism. I teach this stuff at, at UCL. Um, and what was the brief today? It was about hope, wasn't it? Um, yeah. Well, one of the things that I derive hope from in, in thinking about science is that we do have a pernicious history. My science in particular, genetics and evolutionary biology, is mired and un, unequivocally attached to some of the worst crimes that humankind has ever committed. That is the history, but the trajectory of our history brings me enormous hope. 
Anyway, I've written a number of books, and um, the last two were uh, very serious and about eugenics and the history of racism, but the one before that, you know, when you have children, you, you love them all equally. No one has a favorite child. Well, that's a lie we tell ourselves, isn't it? You all have your favorite children. Um, and one of my books, the one before the race book, was, I think, my favorite, but unloved by the public, and actually not on sale downstairs to demonstrate quite how unloved, unloved it was. But it wasn't mired in the worst atrocities that humankind has ever managed. Instead, it was about us. It was about what evolution and genetics can tell us about how we came to be what we are. And in some ways, it was a retelling of the second best book by my intellectual hero, Charles Darwin, The Descent of Man, uh, which we celebrated the uh, 150th anniversary uh, of last year. And in that, following on from The Origin of Species, he applies evolutionary theory to us. Now, The Descent of Man is my favorite Darwin book, not just because of its scientific brilliance, but also it reveals his very human flaws. It's laced with white supremacy that was very typical of the Victorian era, um, despite Darwin himself being uh, a lifelong abolitionist. He displays a very casual and grotesque sexism, also rooted in Victorian thinking of powerful white men, uh, that women are simply incapable of displaying the same intellectual prowess of men. Now, a conversation I had with Natalie um, a few years ago when we were recording a Radio 4 program together, I say recording it together, I was counting the chapters of the Iliad for her. Um, <laughs> But she said something about Aristotle, which, um, which land, struck a chord with me. Aristotle also had deeply sexist and somewhat bizarre views about women, including that they had a different number of teeth to men. <laughs> something which really could have been rectified by counting them. <laughs> um, but what Nat said to me was that she felt on the strength of his other writings that 15 minutes with Aristotle and Natalie Haynes and she could cure him of that misogyny and that sexism. Um, and that is what I also think about Charles Darwin. Now, about the de descent of man, there's a very telling phrase in the introduction which I think could be a mantra for our age. It is this, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. I have that printed out and stuck on, on my desk. The, the book that I wrote, which is called The Book of Humans, um, is really a rewriting of, of uh, The Descent of Man. And it's really about the conundrum of, of being human, the paradox inherent in our being. There's a line, Darwin's a great stylist, and there's a line near the beginning which goes like this. With his godlike intellect, which has penetrated the movements of the solar system with all these exalted powers, man still bears in his bodily frame the indelible stamp of his lowly origin. There is that central paradox of human. We are biological, we are part of evolution's great tree of life, and yet, here we are, doing these special things. Now, he was a great stylist, but I think the same idea was expressed by, possibly, arguably, a better writer a few hundred years earlier. What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how infinite in faculty, in action, how like an angel, in apprehension, how like a god, the paragon of animals. And yet, to me, what is this quintessence of dust? It's exactly the same idea. There we are, this special creature, but we are still just dust. Incidentally, I wanted to call the book The Paragon of Animals, um, but my editor said that was really pretentious. <laughs> now, I do quote a lot in my work, and I'm a big film nerd, and I found myself writing a line which I thought was my own, which was, again, the third expression of that same idea, that paradox of the human condition. And the line was this, everyone is special, which is another way of saying that no one is. I will give a free book to the person who could identify what that is from. The it's from The Incredibles. It's Dash. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Oliver. Anyway, the book is about what is unique. <laughs> See, that brings me a lot of hope. <laughs> the book of humans is about what makes us unique and what makes us not. It's about language and tools and sex and violence and sex. There's a lot of sex in, in the book. The public didn't like, love it. Um, and it's not on sale down, downstairs. But it is a deeply humanist book. And it goes to great lengths to push us off the pedestals that we have occupied at our own behest, but also reveal that we are a very special ape. 
And ultimately, it conveys the idea that there is something special about us. We call it in science because we're inherently dull creatures. We call it cultural transmission. But fundamentally, it is the way that ideas and knowledge are passed between individuals, between groups, and down the generations. And this is a very 21st century science, but it's right there in, in the descent of man. We are effectively a species of teacher. We're also a species of expert. No other creature has such uneven distribution of expertise across a population. If you want to get your car fixed, you go to a car mechanic. If you want to understand what love is, you listen to Taylor Swift, <laughs> I believe. If you want to know how many people to shake hands with in a room of 201, you ask a mathematician. We are a species of experts. And Darwin spotted this in The Descent of Man, and it was 150 years before it was confirmed using Bayesian statistics and very complex genetics and science. But fundamentally, he expressed it in the final paragraphs of The Descent of Man, and it is this. I'm going to update this out of Victorian language to be more inclusive. As humans advance in civilization and small tribes are united into larger communities, the simplest reason would tell each individual that he or she ought to extend their social instincts and sympathies to all members of the same nation, though personally unknown to them. This point being once reached, there is only an artificial barrier to prevent our sympathies extending to the people of all nations and races. And that gives me hope. Thank you. Thank you.